develop a relationship with your compliance officer, if you're the business person, such that when you have the stressful situation, you know each other and you understand each other and you understand each other's objectives. Welcome to the Rain Insights Podcast. I'm Emily Donahue. In this current global business environment, organizations must be both quick and nimble to adapt to the constantly changing government regulations, both domestically and globally. Compliance officers work both internally and externally to make sure everyone in an organization and the organization itself follows the rules. Simple missteps could bring hefty fines, legal woes, or more importantly, perhaps, damage to a company's reputation. In this Rain Insights podcast, founder David Lawrence speaks to Lisa Shallot, former Goldman Sachs partner, advisor to startups, board director, founder, and brand builder about compliance across the board. Lisa, first of all, I want to thank you. It's uh, a continued privilege and honor. And for the members of our audience, um, Lisa was one of the non-taxable benefits of my tenure at Goldman Sachs, the opportunity to work extensively with her and to learn from her. So it's truly great to have you on the podcast today. I thought I would start, and I know you're, I'll, I'll fill in the blanks if, because you tend to be overly modest, but I think it would be great to um, for you to give a bit of an overview of your professional uh, bio and the various positions you've held, because I think uh, that's important in uh, understanding the authenticity of the message and the themes that you'll be conveying today. Well, David, it is a pleasure to be here. I really appreciate the invitation. And without question, getting to work with you was an absolute highlight of my time at Goldman Sachs. And and since then, uh, here we are collaborating again. So um, just to give you a quick overview of my career, I spent 20 years at Goldman Sachs, uh, the first 11 of which were in the equities division where because of my Japan background, I started in Japanese equity sales in New York, went on to eventually run uh, the Japanese shares business for North America, moved to Tokyo, ran the Japanese shares business globally, came back to New York and ran international equity sales and trading, and would have thought that I would have stayed there for the rest of my career and then suddenly got picked up uh, and dropped into global compliance as the chief operating officer. And over a four and a half year period, which corresponded with some real upheaval in the uh, financial services industry, um, when uh, Bear Stearns blew up and Lehman blew up and Goldman became a bank holding company, uh, I was stretched across compliance, legal and audit as the chief operating officer. And then uh, four and a half years into that, so in 2010, I raised my hand for my next thing and uh, was asked to go to the executive office and become the head of brand marketing and digital strategy. They added the and digital strategy to make sure someone was paying attention to it, but I don't think anyone really knew what that meant um, with respect to managing Goldman's brand. And that really uh, catapulted me into a brand crisis scenario where uh, Goldman was the poster child for all that was evil on Wall Street, and it was um, really a fascinating lesson in managing reputational risk uh, and also watching the rise of all of these social and digital channels that we now cannot live without. So um, first of all, thank you for uh, the overview. And I'll just add that throughout all those positions, uh, you were renowned uh, for being one of the thought leaders and one of the great collaborators uh, inside Goldman in terms of the organization of the effort and, and getting getting things right. And while it appears that, you know, the different positions you assumed at Goldman, and we'll, we're, we're going to get into what you've been doing uh, subsequently um, a little later in the podcast, it would have seen those positions are very, very different. You know, as I came to know you and, and work with you, uh, obviously, there were aspects of each business that you brought into your whatever your present duties were. And one of the reasons I think you were as effective as you were was because you had experience on the business side and through compliance and obviously on the business side, you had a great deal of experience in understanding the importance of reputation and reputational risk management and the importance of 
communications, both internally in an organization, but externally. So I'd actually like to unpack that and, you know, find ourselves in 2021. It's uh, to quote Yogi Berra, very often it feels like deja vu all over again with continued um, issues within organizations uh, to try to get it right. Uh, compliance failures, regulatory failures, uh, issues that raise questions about confidence and trust in institutions. And by the way, I just editorialized for one second. This is not a private sector issue. It's very much true for public agencies, constant challenges to make sure that they are remaining true to their mission and that their people are adhering to the standards of conduct that are expected of them by all their stakeholders. And certainly, you know, as we've emerged from the pandemic and a lot of lessons learned about management of risk and responsibility and, you know, the horrific video that came out of Minneapolis and people all of a sudden focusing on, you know, the issues around the police and how members of the community are treated. There are a lot of lessons for us to learn on on, on all sides, and that's why I'm, I'm really just uh, so grateful to begin to have a conversation with you. So I'd like to start by unpacking, as, as you understand the term compliance, and uh, you understand that you know, the elements of legal, regulatory, and reputational risk management. How did you begin to unpack it, think about it differently, and think about sort of institutionally what needs to be accomplished? Um, when I arrived in compliance, I certainly did not pretend to know more than the people around me. Um, you know, in my role in the equities division, I, of course, worked with compliance officers. They were excellent. I viewed them as vital to my business. So I wasn't completely in the dark as to what compliance was and thankfully was in a culture that uh, regarded compliance as, as critical and, and, and very important and, and respected. But I suddenly was surrounded by experts in, um, in rules and in regulations and in policies and procedures. And I really had to understand what did it mean to be a compliance officer? How did that feel? What were the pain points? What were the pressures? And I really went on a listening tour and spent some time with compliance officers all throughout um, you know, the, the firm and the world um, in all of their different roles, just so I can really try to get my head around what does it take to be an excellent compliance officer? I had my own opinions because I had been a client of compliance, um, but I really wanted to hear from compliance officers what their experience was. And I, I would say that what I, what I quickly came to realize um, was that number one, compliance was an even harder job than I had imagined it was. To be you know, on the line making calls, um, to be expected to you know, see everything and anticipate everything, which is, which is impossible, um, is, is incredibly hard to understand uh, businesses in the context of the rules and the regulations and, um, and the people uh, doing it, you know, it is, is not easy. But what I, what I immediately saw and, um, you know, was very motivated to kind of justify my own existence amidst all of these experts, what value was I going to add? was that coming from a, a, I'll say revenue, but I hate using that term because I view compliance as part of the value chain that ultimately leads a firm to, to generate revenues. But coming from a business where everybody was covering external clients, I realized that you acquire a skill in managing relationships, in being proactive, and in really having dialogue in a way that when I looked at and observed how compliance officers were performing were not things that were often done and were not things that were at all taught. And so there was a whole kind of curriculum that I saw as a possibility 
around the things that I guess you learn when you learn to be an effective business person that could be brought into the, the training and the um, definition of excellence for compliance officers that would have a huge impact on um, really establishing the kinds of relationships that transform compliance officers from what they were regarded as initially as the people who say no. You don't want to call them early. You want to call them late in the process because they're going to get in the way of a process. They're going to impede business. They're going to be an obstacle. They're going to say no. That was not a great brand, but that was how compliance was regarded. Or you're only going to deal with compliance when you have a very stressful situation and uh, it's a problem. You call them and they have to deal with you in a problem. And that, that defines your relationship to instead see an opportunity where compliance for all of their amazing expertise could actually be a tremendous asset and enabler such that if you thought of them that way, then you would call compliance officers in early. They'd be right as part of your team as you're thinking of a new business or a new way of doing things, or you develop a relationship with your compliance officer. If you're the business person, such that when you have the stressful situation, you know each other and you understand each other and you understand each other's objectives. So building that kind of mentality very much in the air you breathe when you're covering external clients into how compliance officers do their job was something I got really excited about and started to, you know, test and talk about. And I saw that the compliance officers were getting really excited about that. And I think that ultimately that led to a whole framework and a whole way of thinking that I think transformed the effect effectiveness of compliance and the relationship and relevance, uh, you know, with which it was viewed. I want to uh, unpack that a little bit, Lisa, because I think you, you, you bring up some very important themes. Number one, uh, you're coming to the compliance space. You brought a great deal of business experience and you understood the business and I'll, I'll use the word empathy. You had empathy for the types of things that the business people had to do, the client relationships, what they had to manage, the speed of decisions that had to be made, etc. cetera. Uh, you also did a, a great deal of listening to what it meant to be on the front line as a compliance professional to be called upon to make decisions. And what I'm hearing you say is that the most effective compliance officers, and let's talk about compliance programs, are the ones where the people who are either on the business side or the compliance side actually have an appreciation for their respective jobs and requirements and actually understand a bit about the types of decisions that have to be made, the speed, et cetera. And that compliance is not, when, when effectively done, it's not just raising your hand about a problem, but helping to solve these issues and solve them in the right way. Uh, almost as a, I'll call it as a partnership, but recognizing that there are clear lines of division of responsibility uh, within an organization. And you and I have spoken before. It's interesting because I know you did a lot of rethinking about the model for compliance. And yes, everyone has the policies, the procedures, the rules. They take the training videos. But one of the things that I know you spent a lot of time thinking about and meeting with regulators and also internal business people, but peers at other organizations, is that compliance is very much a matter of the culture of an organization. And that was a very important theme that I know the Federal Reserve and some very, very smart people began to talk about, that compliance being less rules-based than culture-based. And maybe you could explain you know, that thesis and some of the thinking that you've done around that, because uh, I know boards of directors with and I know you've done a lot of work with boards. It is something that boards began to focus on as well. 
So to think about a compliant organization as one where the culture was right, not just a mere set of rules and policies and procedures and training initiatives. Sure. Look, I, I, a culture is a, is a topic that I, I still think a lot about and um, found it very interesting when the regulatory environment started to really focus on culture, as you say. I think that the, the, the real aim is to have a culture in which everyone feels that they own and are accountable for things like integrity, things like doing the right thing, things like respecting the rules, um, protecting the reputation, acting in the right way. Um, and you know, a lot of that needs to be spoken of and spoken of often, but what you don't want is a culture where the compliance people are viewed as the police and are out there to, you know, catch people, um, doing things that might not be right. Um, and you, you want everyone to feel that, that spirit of, of ownership and integrity. I think that that's when, you know, you have a great culture and that has to come from a tone from the top. And that has to cascade all the way to what people are taught when they walk in the door, if not before they're even hired. And so, you know, it's a shared responsibility um, and it's a, it's a value system. And if that doesn't exist, it's, it's really, really difficult to say that you have a good culture. Even in a good culture, things can go wrong. Um, if someone decides that they're going to be a bad actor, you know, you hope that you have the systems in place to catch it, but you might not. Um, but in terms of it being a culture, you don't want it to be a set of responsibilities that are owned by some and not others. Everyone has to own them. And I think, I think that is what um, is, is a really, really important thing. And sometimes, you know, a clue to that is to look at how thoughtful the organization has been, for example, as to the, the reporting lines of compliance, how independent the uh, compliance function is, how embedded but independent the compliance function is, how um, senior compliance officers might be part of the most, the most important decision-making bodies at the firm, maybe sitting on an executive committee or a management committee. That's how, those are signs of, of a culture that's really founded in integrity. We'll get back to our conversation in just a moment. You can get access to critical risk insight and analysis. Subscribe to Rain's core membership and you'll get our daily risk book digest, weekly intelligence briefs on cyber, geopolitical and financial crime, access to knowledge sharing webinars and breaking alerts on important risk developments. Find out how Rain can power your business to success at rainnetwork.com. That's R A N E network.com. And I want to get this into actionable steps and recognizing the work that you do with many members of public boards and the portfolio companies of leading sponsor clients. The question is, how do we get there? And I remember uh, there was a, a question coming out of the financial crisis. Can we, should we? The fact that something might be lawful doesn't mean that necessarily an organization should be doing things. And the Federal Reserve, the SEC, were very much proponents of organizations asking themselves precisely those questions. And when you think about you know, ownership of an organization and the issues, I, I think you start to delve into, and this is hopefully as you know, we continue our work together, this is actually, I'm giving our audience a little bit of a, a teaser here in terms of what we hopefully will be working on. There are elements of human psychology and social psychology that I think have yet to play out in the compliance space. So every company has a lofty statement by their CEO and has you know the training and the speeches and things like that. But invariably inside an organization, people are pretty adept at watching body language and who gets rewarded 
and whose behavior seems to be ignored. Maybe you could share sort of um, with the audience a little bit about how you get the types of things that organizations and compliance professionals and business people alike should be thinking about about how to translate the and, and ensure that these statements about business principles and reputational management, but how do you ensure that 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 is actually what people are doing, that's what they're breathing when they walk in and, and leave, that is the talk that they actually are walking? I think that first there needs to be a foundation of respect. And I think that if you have, you know, two sides of a conversation, each side needs to make sure that it understands what it feels like to be in the other person's position. Um, because without that, it's really difficult to, to collaborate well and get things right. And if you have a fundamental you know, respect for the, the different roles that people play, then you can have real relationships. And it's in those relationships that you can then have the kinds of discussions when things are gray. Uh, I, I wish that things were black and white uh, you know, more often, but they're not. We all deal with a lot of gray and compliance often lives in a world of gray. And so if you have the relationships and if you've invested in an understanding of what are the pressures? What are the objectives? What are you trying to do? Here's how you can do it. Here are the guardrails, all of these things. Then hopefully you have enough respect such that when a situation arises that the right people are brought into the room to discuss it and that when the discussion happens, it is a debate and different views are brought together in order to try to collectively get to the right answer. And, you know, that has to be a conversation in which someone's going to play devil's advocate um, and someone else is going to, you know, make the case. And then hopefully you deal with the should we part, because often you don't you don't always know with clarity when you walk in to have that conversation what you're going to come out with. You just try to get to the right answer. But the conditions for getting to, I'll just say the best answer, are respect and relationships. And those take investments and intentionality ahead of time. And when you're proactive and you do those things, then you can really try to navigate well. That, that's, that's my view on those things. And so I'm going to put a, another term around that. That is the ability to maintain intellectual honesty within an organization. So you've touched upon the ability to actually get into a room with others. And yes, there's a lot of ambiguity in the world. You know, business by its very nature involves risk. And so the ability to access other people, have the ability to get additional perspectives and not be afraid to raise your hand and ask a question. That's what I'm hearing as well from you know, well, this process. Well, let, let, let me just interject there for a moment because yes, you know, you want to create, I guess, let's call it the psychological safety, the safe space where in that room, someone can raise their hand. But even more than that, if you really take it a step further, if you're trying to get to good outcomes, good answers, thoughtful conversation, you want someone's responsibility, if not everyone's, to be to request that input, not to wait for someone to feel brave enough to raise their hand. Hopefully they feel safe enough, but they still might not. So you want to seek out those perspectives so that, and you want to have a diverse group of people in the room so that hopefully you surround that issue with, with a lot of interesting, you know, in, intelligence. And then hopefully in talking that through, you can get to whatever the right place is. One of the reasons I remained at Goldman for 20 years and no organization, as you said, uh, is risk-free without its faults and no organization doesn't have its, its missteps. But there were groups of people and committees with that precise diversity of, of views 
and diversity of, I'll call it, uh, of experience, where I always felt there was a collective intelligence in the room around issues. And, and I, I, I developed a saying that the room was never wrong. We might make the wrong decision, but the room, you know, waited and was aware of the potential issues and the potential downside. But as a matter of uh, maintaining the culture of an organization, having the ability and the processes, and if you want to say committees, or if you want to say the rooms where people can meet, you know, with the appropriate folks and, and, you know, share questions and issues and hopefully solve problems, not just raise them, that that, that is uh, an essential element to maintaining the culture of an organization. You know, you mentioned willingness, and I'm going to push on that again, just like I did with, you know, raise the hand. It's one thing to be willing, but it's a, a whole different culture if the expectation is there and everybody knows the expectation is there that your perspective is valued and you're expected to share it. All of a sudden, it, it shifts from who's willing to an expectation that the room will be smarter. Um, and if you're in the room that you have not only a right to speak, but that what you're going to say is going to be a valuable part of, of that calculus. So I, I, I think it's a little bit of a tweak, um, but it, it's, a, it's a mindset that, that goes a step further than, than creating safety, mere safety. And the other thing that I want to say is, you know, uh, you, you've reminded me that one of my favorite questions um, during that listening period that I, that I talked about initially and then that I've used ever since has been to just ask, why do we do things the way we do them? Um, why do we do things this way? And, you know, when you're, when you're new, you can ask that all, all day long. Um, you know, when you've been in a in a certain role for a while, you, you might look a little bit silly, but that is a really profound question. And it usually takes five whys for, for you to get to the answer of, because we've always done it that way. Um, and, and, that, and that opens the door to every so often assess, how are we doing things? Is this still the best way to do it? And is there a better way? You know, because even in the rooms that we're talking about, right, which, which you know, we've seen exist and which, you know, are, are creating the right kind of culture and debate and dialogue and hopefully good answers. Um, do those rooms hold up a mirror and say, okay, you know, we, we've been doing it this way. Is this, still, is this still the best way? Because I think we need to revisit those things every so often too. But Asking, asking why we do things the way we do them is, was, a, was a real kind of skeleton key for me, in a way. I think that's a, a great point, and it's also one of the benefits as you bring in new people, empowering them to ask those questions. And, and, and David, let me, let me interject one other thing, because you brought up the GE example of that rotation, and to some degree, my, my career was sort of that, even though I didn't didn't plan it that way. And, um, you know, whenever I look back on, on the, what seemingly are very distinct, different, disparate experiences, you know, you can either choose to see differences or you can choose to see similarities. And I've realized that I tend to be a person that looks for what's similar in seemingly different things. And when you do that, you, you know, it's a, it's a great, way to spot risks. Um, when you do that, it's a, it's a great way to see opportunities to bring something valuable or a best practice from one place to another place, even though you'd never think that those businesses were related. And so I think that the opportunity to do a lot of different things um, is, and, and, be, and be agile in that way you know, enables you to connect dots. And there's really no vocabulary for it that I've found yet. Um, but, you know, when I think about getting back to compliance for a moment, when I think about 
the, the best compliance officers, one of the skills that they had was, you know, really being able to see risk in, in a lot of different dimensions in seemingly different places and recognize where a risk over here could be a risk over there and connect those dots. Okay, so you've opened up one of my favorite cans, Lisa, which is the importance of not just a myriad of bringing a myriad of experience to this position, but how people continue to be smart, to be aware where they're taking in their information, how are they connecting the dots. A favorite quote that you and I have shared is uh, Muhammad Ali about the person who at age 50 thinks the same way as they did at age 20 has wasted 30 good years. And one of the things that I have noticed about the most effective leaders and, and whether they're in compliance or on the business side or technology or operational is that these people continue not only to learn, but to take in information from what has happened in other organizations and in other situations. And maybe you can share with us just your thoughts about, I don't want to call it continuing education, let's call it continued thinking and the ability to rethink, ask the questions, as you've said, about why are we, why do we do things in a certain way and to apply either lessons or themes, or if you're reading that the chairman of the SEC is expressing some concern about his or her, uh, something that he or she is seeing in the marketplace, why that might prompt you to begin to think what's happening inside your organization, et cetera. But this continued process of thinking and learning, I, I want you to, I want to push you on this, which is the almost obligation and the, as well as the benefits of this continued learning process. So, you know, I love this topic too. And, you know, one, I think one theme that's, that's been woven throughout this discussion we've had is, is really about, you know, creating the conditions for an intentionality around um, all of these different interactions and behaviors and, 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 and ways of thinking. Um, so the way I respond to what you're describing is to very intentionally think about what I call my surface area of learning. And I uh, think about that in terms of how I keep that constantly refreshed, how I keep that wide and diverse. And part of that is, to your point, where am I getting my information? Is there a diversity of sources? What do I tend to rely on? Looking at kind of where I'm allocating my attention and what I'm giving credit to and how that's serving me in making me think and, and, and revisit things or, or have a fresh view. And then it's partially about my network. And thankfully, because I've done a lot of things, I, I have, you know, what, I, what I'd like to think is a, is a broad network. And I think having that kind of breadth of a network as opposed to a narrow one ensures that you are constantly exposed to lots of different ideas, lots of different perspectives, lots of different contexts. And I thrive in that situation, but I ensure that that is kind of how I'm moving around and what I'm taking in. Um, so I, I think you, you have to create that, which is important. It doesn't just happen. And I think if you are passive about that, then you're going to end up with very narrow networks and you're going to end up with very narrow sources of information. And, and the other thing that I'd add to that that's related, I think, is to always make sure that you're thinking expansively and not falling into the trap of being very siloed. When, when you think about, for example, one's ability to impact lots of things or um, how one's role could actually be part of much bigger value chains, you know, you can either think about it as, well, I only own this piece, so I'm only going to care about this piece. Or you can take a step back and say, hold on, my function here is actually relevant to this breadth of stuff. And therefore, I feel some ownership. I feel some accountability. And you know what? I need to learn more. 
so I can figure out how my piece can serve the rest of this whole series of events. And I think you have to have a mindset and an intentionality around operating that way. And that ensures that you're, you're always encountering new things and questioning uh, in a healthy way the way that you are thinking about stuff. Lisa, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts, perspectives, a a conversation that I know and and certainly hope will continue and some great insights. So thank you again. Always love talking with you. This was no exception. Thank you very much for the privilege. Individuals and organizations turn to RAIN for risk intelligence that cuts through the hype to focus on what they need to know, what to expect, and what to do. The hub of RAIN service is the democratization of information and expertise. Subscribe to RAIN's core membership and let us power your business to success. Learn more at rainnetwork.com. That's R-A-N-E network.com. I'm Emily Donahue. Thanks for listening.